It is time for another Sunday storytelling with Gregory Sadler. That's me. And I have been running through some of my favorite short stories of all time, many of which I've read as a younger person. And the one that I've got picked out for today is no exception. It is That Hellbound Train, which you can find in this book, Pleasant Dreams Dash Nightmares by Robert Block, who's written many, many great short stories and quite a few excellent novels as well. And so this one, I, I, by the way, I do recommend you read the other stories in this. Um, this is interesting, too, because the dedication is for August Derleth, Fritz Leiber, Samuel Peoples, three who have shared my nightmares. And uh, this is actually published by Arkham House, which is here in Wisconsin. If you don't know the history of Arkham House, it was founded by Derleth, and I forget who the other person was, and they brought back into publication, among other people, H.P. Lovecraft's stories. So Block is following in a great progression. So I'm going to read this story, That Hellbound Train, and then afterwards we can have some, some chat. You can leave comments on the side and I'll respond to them. And I'll tell you before I jump into it a little bit of how I came to run into this story and why I find it so fascinating. And then maybe we'll have some more discussion of that afterwards. So this is a perennial trope of somebody meeting the devil and making a bargain with them. And you're going to notice that there's some references in it to other deals that people have made with the devil. So there's a little bit of what we call intertextuality in Block stuff, even though he sometimes has his characters being a little bit dismissive of that. And this is one of the rare occasions where the devil doesn't get his due, as you're going to find out. Now, I read this as a kid. I don't know how old I was when I read it. It was in one of those Alfred Hitchcock anthologies that were put together, I think, essentially for young people, but they had some pretty adult stories in them. And my uncle Hubert, who I've done a video, actually maybe two videos on, was the person who for every Christmas, about five years in a row, would buy me um, one of those Hitchcock anthologies. So I, I read this as a kid and I thought it was a really cool story. And on rereading it recently, I actually think it's cooler for reasons I'll tell you about. So with no further ado, let me launch into reading this and then uh, don't let me forget because I've actually got another idea about reading that I want to put out there later on and get people's take on. So, That Hellbound Train by Robert Block. When Martin was a little boy, his daddy was a railroad man. He never rode the high iron, but he walked the tracks for the CB and Q, and he was proud of his job. And when he got drunk, which was every night, he sang this old song about that hell-bound train. Martin didn't quite remember any of the words, but he couldn't forget the way his daddy sang them out. And when daddy made the mistake of getting drunk in the afternoon and got squeezed between a Penn C tank car and an AT and s &F gondola, Martin sort of wondered why the Brotherhood didn't sing the song at his funeral. After that, things didn't go so good for Martin, but somehow he always recalled Daddy's song. When Mom up and ran off with a traveling salesman from Keokuk, Daddy must have turned over in his grave knowing she'd done such a thing, and with a passenger, too. Martin hummed the tune to himself every night in the orphan home, and after Martin himself ran away, he used to whistle the song at night in the jungles after the other bindle stiffs were asleep. Martin was on the road for four or five years before he realized he wasn't getting any place. Of course, he tried his hand at a lot of things, fruit in Oregon, washing dishes in Montana hash house, but he just wasn't cut out for seasonal labor or pearl diving either. Then he graduated to stealing hubcaps in Denver, and for a while he did pretty good with tires in Oklahoma City. But by the time he'd put in six months on the chain gang down in Alabama, he knew he had no future drifting around this way on his own. So 
He tried to get on the railroad like his daddy had. They told him times were bad. And between the truckers and the airlines and those fancy new fin tails General Motor was making, it looked as if the days of the high ballers were just about over. But Martin couldn't keep away from the railroads. Wherever he traveled, he rode the rods. He'd rather hop a freight heading north in sub-zero weather than lift his thumb to hitch a ride with a Cadillac headed for Florida. Because Martin was loyal to the memory of his daddy, and he wanted to be as much like him as possible, come what may. Of course, he couldn't get drunk every night, but whenever he did manage to get a hold of a can of Sterno, he'd sit there under a nice warm culvert and think about the old days. Often as not, he'd hum the song about that hellbound train. That was the train the drunks and the sinners rode, the gambling men and the grifters, the big time spenders, the skirt chasers, and all the jolly crew. It would be fun to take a trip in such company, but Martin didn't like to think about what happened when that train finally rolled into the depot down way down yonder. He didn't figure on spending eternity stoking boilers in hell without even a company union to protect him. Still, it would be a lovely ride if there was such a thing as a hellbound train, which, which of course, there wasn't. At least Martin didn't think there was until that evening when he found himself walking the tracks heading south, just out of Appleton Junction. The night was cold and dark the way November nights are in the Fox River Valley, and he knew he'd have to work his way down to New Orleans for the, for the winter, or maybe even Texas. Somehow he didn't feel much like going, even though he'd heard that a lot of those Texas automobiles had solid gold hubcaps. No, sir, he just wasn't cut out for petty larceny. It was worse than a sin. It was unprofitable, too. Bad enough to do the devil's work, but then to get such miserable pay on top of it. Maybe he'd better let the Salvation Army convert him. Martin trudged along, humming Daddy's song, waiting for a rattler to pull out of the junction behind him. He'd have to catch it. There was nothing else for him to do. Too bad there wasn't a chance to make a better deal for himself somewhere. Might as well be a rich sinner as a poor sinner. Besides, he had a notion he could strike a pretty shrewd bargain. He'd thought about it a lot these past few years, particularly when the sterno was working. Then his ideas would come on strong and he could figure a way to rig the setup. But that was all nonsense, of course. He might as well join the gospel shouters and turn into a working stiff like all the rest of the world. No use dreaming dreams. A song was only a song and there was no hellbound train. There was only this train rumbling out of the night, roaring towards him along the track from the south. Martin peered ahead, but his eyes couldn't match his ears. And so far, all he could recognize was the sound. It was a train, though. He felt the steel shudder and sing beneath his feet. And yet, how could it be? The next station south was Nina Menasha, and there was nothing due out of there for hours. The clouds were thick overhead, and the field mist rolled like a cold fog at a November midnight. Even so, Martin should have been able to see the headlights as the train rushed on, but there were no lights. There was only the whistle screaming out the black throat of the night. Martin could recognize the equipment of just about any locomotive ever built, but he'd never heard a whistle that sounded like this one. It wasn't signaling. It was screaming like a lost soul. He stepped to one side, for the train was almost on top of him now, and suddenly there it was, looming along the tracks and grinding to a stop in less time he'd ever believed possible. The wheels hadn't been oiled because they screamed too, screamed like the damned, but the train slid to a halt and the screams died away into a series of low groaning sounds, and Martin looked up and saw that it was a passenger train. It was big and black, without a single light shining in the engine cab or any of the long string of cars. And Martin couldn't read any of the lettering on his sides, but he was pretty sure this train didn't belong on the Northwestern Road. He was even more sure when he saw the man clamber down out of the forward car. There was something wrong about the way he walked, as though one of his feet dragged. And there was something even more disturbing about the lantern he carried and what he did with it. The lantern was dark, and when the man alighted, he held it up to his mouth and blew. 
Instantly, the lantern glowed redly. You don't have to be a member of the Railway Brotherhood to know that that is a mighty peculiar way of lighting a lantern. As the figure approached, Martin recognized the conductor's cap perched on his head, and this made him feel a little better for a moment until he noticed that it was worn a bit too high, as though there were, might be something sticking up on the forehead underneath it. Still, Martin knew his manners, and when the man smiled at him, he said, Good evening, Mr. Conductor. Good evening, Martin. How did you know my name? The man shrugged. How did you know I was the conductor? You are, aren't you? To you. Yes, although to other people in other walks of life may recognize me in different roles. For instance, you ought to see what I look like to the folks out in Hollywood. The man grinned. I travel a great deal, he explained. What brings you here? Martin asked. Why, you ought to know the answer to that, Martin. I came because you needed me. I did. Don't play the innocent. Ordinarily, I seldom bother with single individuals anymore. The way the world is going, I can expect to carry a full load of passengers without soliciting business. Your name has been down on the list for several years already. I reserved a seat for you as a matter of course. But then tonight, I suddenly realized you were backsliding, thinking of joining the Salvation Army, weren't you? Well, Martin hesitated, don't be ashamed. To err is human, as somebody or other once said. Reader's Digest, was it? Never mind. The point is, I felt you needed me, so I switched over and came your way. What for? Why, to offer you a ride, of course. Isn't it better to travel comfortably by train than to march along the cold streets behind a Salvation Army band? Hard on the feet, they tell me, and even harder on the eardrums. I'm not sure I'd care to ride your train, sir, Martin said, considering where I'm likely to end up. Ah, yes, the old argument, the conductor sighed. I suppose you'd prefer some sort of bargain. Is that it? Exactly, Martin answered. Well, I'm afraid I'm all through with that sort of thing. As I mentioned before, times have changed. There's no shortage of prospective passengers anymore. Why should I offer you any special inducements? You must want me, or else you wouldn't have bothered to go out of your way to find me. The conductor sighed again. Uh, there you have a point. Pride was always my besetting weakness, I'll admit. And somehow I'd hate to lose you to the competition, thinking of you as my own all these years. He hesitated. Yes, I'm prepared to deal with you on your own terms if you insist. The terms? Martin asked. Standard proposition, anything you want. Ah, said Martin, but I warn you in advance, there'll be no tricks. I'll grant you any wish you can name, but in return, you must promise to ride the train when the time comes. Suppose it never comes. Oh, it will. Suppose I've got the kind of wish that will keep me off forever. There is no such wish. Don't be so sure. Let me worry about that, the conductor told him. No matter what you have in mind, I'll warn you that I'll collect in the end, and there'll be none of this last-minute hocus-pocus either. No last-minute repentance, no blonde fra lines or fancy lawyer showing up to get you off. I offer a clean deal. That is to say, you'll get what you want, and I'll get what I want. I heard you trick people. They say you're worse than a used car salesman. Now, wait a minute. I apologize, Martin said hastily, but it is supposed to be a fact that you can't be trusted. I admit it. On the other hand, you, sin you seem to think you've found a way out. A surefire proposition. Surefire. Very funny. The man began to chuckle, then halted. But we waste valuable time, Martin. Let's get down to cases. What do you want from me? A single wish. Name it, and I shall grant it. Anything you said? Anything at all. Very well, then. Martin took a deep breath. I want to be able to stop time. Right now? No, no, not yet, and not for everybody. I realize the world, would th this that would be impossible, of course, but I want to be able to stop time for myself just once in the future. Whenever I get to a point when I know I'm happy and contented, that's where I'd like to stop so I can just keep on being happy forever. That's quite a proposition, 
the conductor mused. I've got to admit, I've never heard anything just like it before. And believe me, I've listened to some Lulus in my day. He grinned at Martin. You've really been thinking about this, haven't you? For years, Martin admitted. Then he coughed. Well, what do you say? It's not impossible in terms of your own subjective time sense, the conductor murmured. Yes, I think it could be arranged. But I mean really to stop, not just for me to imagine it. I understand, and it can be done. Then you'll agree? Why not? I promised you, didn't I? Give me your hand. Martin hesitated. Will it hurt very much? I mean, I don't like the sight of blood and nonsense. You've been listening to a lot of poppycock. We already made our bargain, my boy. No need for a lot of childish rigmarole. I merely intend to put something in your hand the ways and means of fulfilling your wish. After all, there's no telling at just what moment you may decide to exercise the agreement, and I can't drop everything and come running. So it's better if you can regulate matters for yourself. You're going to give me a time stopper? That's the general idea. As soon as I can decide what would be practical. The conductor hesitated. Ah, the very thing. Here, take my watch. He pulled it out of his vest pocket, a railroad watch in a silver case. He opened the back and made a delicate adjustment. Martin tried to see just exactly what he was doing, but the fingers moved in a blinding blur. There we are, the conductor smiled. It's all set now. When you finally decide where you'd like to call a halt, merely turn the stem in reverse and unwind the watch until it stops. When it stops, time stops for you. Simple enough. Sure thing. Then here, take it. And the conductor dropped the watch into Martin's hand. The young man closed his fingers tightly around the case. That's all there is to it? Eh? Absolutely. But remember, you can stop the watch only once. So you better make sure you're satisfied with the moment you choose to prolong. I caution you in all fairness. Make very certain of your choice. I will. Martin grinned. And since you've been so fair about it, I'll be fair too. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. It doesn't really matter what moment I choose because once I stop time for myself, that means I stay where I am forever. I never have to get any older. And if I don't get any older, I'll never die. And if I never die, then I'll never have to take a ride on your train. The conductor turned away. His shoulders shook convulsively and he may have been crying. And you said I was worse than a used car salesman, he gasped in a strangled voice. Then he wandered off in the fog and the train whistle gave an impatient shriek. And all at once it was moving swiftly down the track, rumbling out of sight in the darkness. Martin stood there, blinking down at the silver watch in his hand. If it wasn't that he could actually see it and feel it there, and if he couldn't smell that peculiar odor, he might have thought that he'd imagined the whole thing from start to finish. Train, conductor, bargain, and all. But he had the watch, and he could recognize the scent left by the train as it departed, even though there aren't many locomotives around that use sulfur and brimstone as fuel. And he had no doubts about his bargain. Better still, he had no doubts as to the advantages of the pact he'd made. That's what came of thinking things through to a logical conclusion. Some fools might have settled for wealth or power or Kim Novak. Daddy might have sold out for a fifth of whiskey. Martin knew he'd made a better deal. Better? It was foolproof. All he needed to do now was to choose his moment. And when the right time came, it was his forever. He put his watch in his pocket and started down the railroad track. He hadn't really a destination in mind before, but he did now. He was going to find a moment of happiness. Now, Young Martin wasn't altogether a ninny. He realized perfectly well that happiness is a relative thing. There are conditions and degrees of contentment, and they vary with one's lot in life. As a hobo, he was often satisfied with a warm handout, a double-length bench in the park, or a can of sterno made in 1957, a vintage year. Many a time he'd reached a state of momentary bliss through such agencies, but he was aware that there were better things. Martin determined to seek them out.
Within two days, he was in the great city of Chicago. Quite naturally, he drifted over to West Madison Street and he took steps to elevate his role in life. He became a, a city bum, a panhandler, a moocher. Within a week, he'd risen to the point where happiness was a meal and a regular one-arm luncheon joint, a two-bit flop on a real army cot in a real flop house, and a full fifth of muscatel. There was a night after enjoying all three of these luxuries to the full when Martin was tempted to unwind his watch at the pinnacle of intoxication. Then he remembered the faces of the honest Johns he'd braced for a handout today. True, they were squares, but they were prosperous. They wore good clothes, held good jobs, drove nice cars. And for them, happiness was even more ecstatic. They ate dinner in fine hotels, slept on inner spring mattresses. They drank blended whiskey. Squares or no, they had something there. Martin fingered his watch, put aside the temptation to hock it for another bottle of muscatel, and went to sleep determining to get himself a job and improve his happiness quotient. When he awoke, he had a hangover, but the determination was still with him. It stayed long after the hangover disappeared, and before the month was out, Martin found himself working for a general contractor over on the south side, one of the big rehabilitation projects. He hated the grind, but the pay was good, and pretty soon he got himself a one-room apartment out on Blue Island Avenue. He was accustomed to eating in decent restaurants now, and he bought himself a comfortable bed. And every Saturday night, he went down to the corner tavern. It was all very pleasant, but the foreman liked his work and promised him a raise in a month. If he waited around, the raise would mean he could afford a secondhand car. With a car, he could even start picking up a girl for a date now and then. Lots of other fellows on the job did, and they seemed pretty happy. So Martin kept on working, and the rays came through, and the car came through, and pretty soon a couple of girls came through. The first time it happened, he wanted to unwind his watch immediately, until he got to thinking about what some of the older men always said. There was a guy named Charlie, for example, who worked alongside him on the hoist. When you're young and don't know the score, maybe you get a kick of running around with those pigs, but after a while, you want something better. A nice girl of your own. That's the ticket. Well, he might have something there. At least Martin owed it to himself to find out. If he didn't like it better, he could always go back to what he had. It was worth a try. Of course, nice girls don't grow on trees. If they did, a lot more men would become forest rangers. And almost six months went by before Martin met Lillian Gillis. By that time, he'd had another promotion and was working inside in the office. They made him to go to night school to learn how to do simple bookkeeping, but it meant another 15 bucks extra a week, and it was nicer working indoors. And Lillian was a lot of fun. When she told him she'd marry him, Martin was almost sure the time was now, except that she was sort of, well, she was a nice girl, and she said they'd have to wait until they were married. Of course, Martin couldn't expect to marry her until he had a little more money saved up and another raise would help, too. That took a year. Martin was patient because he knew it was going to be worth it. Every time he had any doubts, he took out his watch and he looked at it, but he never showed it to Lillian or anybody else. Most of the other men wore expensive wristwatches and the old silver railroad watch looked just a little cheap. Martin smiled as he gazed at the stem. Just a few twists and he'd have something none of those other poor working slobs would ever have permanent satisfaction with his blushing bride. Only getting married turned out to be just the beginning. Sure, it was wonderful, but Lillian told him how much better things would be if they could move into a new place and fix it up. Martin wanted decent furniture, a TV set, a nice car, so he started taking night courses and got a promotion to the front office. With the baby coming, he wanted to stick around and see his son arrive, and when it came, he realized he'd have to wait until it got a little older, started to walk and talk and develop a personality of its own. About this time, the company sent him out on the road as a troubleshooter on some of those other jobs, and now he was eating at those good hotels, living high on the hog and the expense account. More than once, he was tempted to unwind his watch. This was the good life, and he realized it could be even better if he just didn't have to work. Sooner or later, if he could cut in on one of the company deals, he could make a pile and retire, then everything would be ideal. 
It happened, but it took time. Martin's son was going to high school before he really got up there in the chips. Martin got the feeling it was now or never because he wasn't exactly a kid anymore. But right about then, he met Sherry Westcott, and she didn't seem to think he was middle-aged at all in spite of the way he was losing hair and adding stomach. She taught him a toupee could cover the bald spot and a cummerbund could cover the pot gut. In fact, she taught him quite a number of things, and he so enjoyed learning that he actually took out his watch and prepared to unwind it. Unfortunately, he chose the very moment when the private detectives broke down the door to the hotel room, and there was a long stretch of time when Martin was so busy fighting the divorce action, he couldn't say honestly he was enjoying any given amount. When he made his final settlement with Lily, he was broke again. And Sherry didn't seem to think he was so young after all. So he squared his shoulders and went back to work. He made his pile eventually, but it took longer this time, and there wasn't much chance to have fun along the way. The fancy dames and the fancy cocktail lounges didn't seem to interest him anymore, and neither did the liquor. Besides, the doc had warned him about that. But there were other pleasures for a rich man to investigate. Travel, for instance, and not riding the rods from one Hickberg to another either. Martin went around the world via plane and luxury liner. For a while, it seemed as if he would find his moment after all. Visiting the Taj Mahal by moonlight, the moon's radiance was reflected from the back of the battered old watch case, and Martin got ready to unwind it. Nobody else was there to watch him, and that's why he hesitated. Sure, this was an enjoyable moment, but he was alone. Lil and the kid were gone. Sherry was gone, and somehow he'd never had time to make any friends. Maybe if he found a few congenial people, he'd have the ultimate happiness. That must be the answer. It wasn't just money or power or sex or seeing beautiful things. The real satisfaction lay in friendship. So on the boat home, Martin tried to strike up a few acquaintances at the ship's bar. But all these people were so much younger and Martin had nothing in common with them. Also, they wanted to dance and drink, and Martin wasn't in condition to appreciate such pastimes. Nevertheless, he tried. Perhaps that's why he had the little accident the day before they docked in San Francisco. Little accident was the way the ship's doctor uh, had of describing it, but Martin looked, he looked, noticed he looked very grave when he told him to stay in bed, and he called an ambulance to meet the liner at the dock and take the patient right to the hospital. At the hospital... The ex all the expensive treatment and expansive smiles and the expensive words didn't fool Martin any. He was an old man with a bad heart, and they thought he was going to die. But he could fool them. He still had the watch. He found it in his coat when he put on his clothes and sneaked out of the hospital before dawn. He didn't have to die. He could cheat death with a single gesture, and he intended to do it as a free man under a free sky. That was the real secret of happiness. He understood it now. Not even friendship meant as much as freedom. This was the best thing of all, to be free of friends or family or the furies of the flesh. Martin walked slowly beside the embankment under the night sky. Come to think of it, he was just about back where he started so many years ago. But the moment was good, good enough to prolong forever. Once a bum, always a bum. He smiled as he thought about it, and then the smile twisted sharply and suddenly, like the pain twisting sharply and suddenly in his chest. The world began to spin, and he fell down the side of the embankment. He couldn't see very well, but he was still conscious, and he knew what had happened. Another stroke, and a bad one. Maybe this was it. Except he wouldn't be a fool any longer. He wouldn't wait to see what was still around the corner. Right now was his chance to use his power and save his life, and he was going to do it. He could still move. Nothing could stop him. He groped in his pocket, pulled out the old silver watch, fumbling with the stem, a few twists, and he'd cheat death. He'd never have to ride that hellbound train. He could go on forever. Forever. Martin had never really considered that word before, to go on forever, but how? Did he want to go on forever like this, a sick old man lying helplessly there in the grass? No, 
He couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And suddenly he wanted very much to cry because he knew that somewhere along the line he'd outsmarted himself. And now it was too late. His eyes dimmed. There was this roaring in his ears. He recognized the roaring, of course, and he wasn't at all surprised to see the train come rushing out of the fog there on the embankment. He wasn't surprised when it stopped there either or when the conductor climbed off and walked slowly towards him. The conductor hadn't changed a bit. Even his grin was still the same. Hello, Martin, he said. All aboard. I know, Martin whispered, but you'll have to carry me. I can't walk. I'm not even really talking anymore, am I? Yes, you are, the conductor said. I can hear you just fine, and you can walk too. He leaned down and placed his hand on Martin's chest. There was a moment of icy numbness, and then sure enough, Martin could walk after all. He got up and followed the conductor along the slope, moving to the side of the train. In here, he asked. No, the next car, the conductor murmured. I guess you're entitled to ride Pullman. After all, you're quite a successful man. You've tasted the joys of wealth and position and prestige. You've known the pleasures of marriage and fatherhood. You sampled the delights of dining and drinking and debauchery too, and you traveled high, wide, and handsome. So let's not have any last minute recriminations. All right, Martin sighed. I guess I can't blame you for my mistakes. On the other hand, you can't take credit for what happened either. I worked for everything I got. I did it all on my own. I didn't even need your watch. So you didn't, the conductor said, smiling. But would you mind giving it back to me now? Need it for the next sucker, eh? Martin muttered. Perhaps. Something about the way he said it made Martin look up. He tried to see the conductor's eyes, but the brim of his hat cast a shadow. So Martin looked down at the watch instead as if seeking an answer there. Tell me something, he said softly. If I give you the watch, what will you do with it? Why, throw it into the ditch, the conductor told him. That's all I'll do with it. And he held out his hand. What if somebody comes along and finds it and twists the stem backwards and stops time? Nobody would do that, the conductor murmured, even if they knew. You mean it was all a trick? This is only an ordinary cheap watch? Oh, I didn't say that, whispered the conductor. I only said that no one has ever twisted the stem backwards. They've all been like you, Martin, looking ahead to find that perfect happiness, waiting for the moment that never comes again. The conductor held out his hand again. Martin sighed and shook his head. You cheated me after all. You cheated yourself, Martin. And now you're going to ride that hellbound train. He pushed Martin up the steps and into the car ahead. As he entered, the train began to move and the whistle screamed. And Martin stood there in the swaying Pullman, ga gazing down the aisle at the other passengers. He could see them sitting there and somehow it didn't seem strange at all. Here they were, the drunks and the sinners, the gambling man and the grifters, the big time spenders, the skirt chasers and all the jolly crew. They all knew where they were going, of course, but they didn't seem to be particularly concerned at the moment. The blinds were drawn on the windows, yet it was light outside and they were all sitting around and singing and passing the bottle and laughing it up, telling their jokes, bragging their brags, just like the way daddy used to sing about them in the old song. Mighty fine traveling companions, Martin said. Well, I've never seen such a pleasant bunch of people. I mean, they seem to be really enjoying themselves. Sorry, the conductor told him. I'm afraid things may not be quite so enjoyable once we pull into that depot way down yonder. For the third time, he held out his hand. Now, before you sit down, if you'll just give me that watch, I mean, a bargain's a bargain. Martin smiled. A bargain's a bargain. He echoed, I agreed to ride your time if I could stop time, your train if I could stop time when I found the right moment of happiness. So if you don't mind, I think I'll just make certain adjustments. Very slowly, Martin twisted, twisted the silver watch stem. No, said the conductor, no, but the watch stem turned. Do you realize what you've done? The conductor panted. Now we'll never reach the depot. We'll just go riding all of us forever and ever. Martin grinned. I know, but the fun's in the trip, not the destination. You taught me that, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful trip. The conductor groaned. All right, he sighed at last. You've got the best of me after all. But when I think of spending eternity trapped here, riding this train, 
Cheer up, Martin said. It won't be that bad. Looks like we have plenty to eat and drink. After all, these are your kind of folks. But I'm the conductor. Think of the endless work this means for me. Don't let it worry you, Martin said. Look, maybe I can even help. If you were to find me another one of those caps now and let me keep this watch. And that's the way it finally worked out. Wearing his cap and carrying his battered old silver watch, there's no happier person in the world, in or out of the world now and forever, than Martin. Martin, the new brake man on that hellbound train. And that is the end of the story, That Hellbound Train by Robert Block, which you can find in this wonderful anthology, Pleasant Dreams Dash Nightmares. Um, among one of my among my favorite short stories, I won't say it's my absolute favorite because I don't have one, but it's certainly up there. And I'm glad I could share this story, which notice there's a lot of cool stuff uh, built in there. I may actually use this for classes down the line. There's reflections on what is human happiness? What goes into it? How do we attain happiness. And then the whole theme of the deal with the devil. And it looks until the very end as if the devil has actually won. But Martin finds a way to subvert the very bargain that they're involved in about the hellbound train. So that is, uh, you know, quite interesting. And Block, of course, is a great author. Um, it's always a lot of fun reading his his stuff. So uh, JB says, I remember Trick the Devil stories were not too uncommon in the horror comics of my youth in the 70s. Yeah, and I think I recall that also being a theme that we'd see sometimes on TV shows. You know, it's, it's a, a great premise. You've got a power that is not good but can grant you what you think is good and will do so at the price of your soul. And, you know, the, the goal is to exchange something for greater value. And there's usually a twist, right? The devil doesn't um, give you something that's going to work out for you in the end. Right. And we see this uh, coming up over and over again as a, a, a trope, as a, motif uh, throughout time. All right. Uh, Perpetual Vinyl says hope is happiness. Um, yeah, for some people. I mean, one of the things that we, we notice about this story is there is not a happiness that is for everybody. So we have to avoid general statements about what happiness consists in. And Martin doesn't need hope. Um, he's on that hellbound train at the end. It's actually the hope of greater happiness ahead that screwed him in this, right? And now that he's actually on the train, he's like, well, this is, this is as good as it's going to get. And this is pretty good. So he pulls the, the stem and twists it. JB says, overly sarcastic productions. Just recently did a nice video on Faustian bargains that might be fun. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Well, we'll see. I don't know overly sarcastic productions, but maybe it could be quite interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll take uh, questions, comments, uh, address whatever people want to bring up um, in, in the meantime. And uh, we got about another 20 minutes or so before I go off to visit the... Uh, cats at the uh, cat refuge and get my little dose of uh, feline interaction. So, which is part of happiness for me, you know, a certain kind of companionship, certain kind of animal, and hopefully I give them a little bit of happiness as well. So um, perpetual vinyl memories, Robert Block novels, a whole bunch of them. You can easily Google it and uh, find them. Um, if I remember right, he is best known for uh, Psycho, right? Um, yep, Psycho. Um, he's written a lot of other weird tales, cosmic horror, and stuff like that. Oh, interestingly enough, this uh, story, that Hellbound Train, won the Hugo Award 
and the Bram Stoker Award and the World Fantasy Award. I just always thought of it as a great story. Uh, what do I recommend? I recommend reading as much as you want. Um, I don't. I don't make a lot of recommendations. There's so much stuff out there that you could read and reread. All right. So JB says in OSP they talk about how power granting the wish is usually malign. Yeah. And the theme of the tragic doom of the protagonist generally reinforces a Christian frame. Earlier stuff has more underdogs that manage to win out by cleverness. Yeah, and you notice in this story, the devil adapts to changing times, which is quite interesting, isn't it? You know? So, um, yeah, I, I suppose, so if we think about this, like in terms of um, other powerful entities that you can be engaged in, like I'm thinking about Descartes' Malin Genie or, you know, evil genius or evil demon that could be deceiving him about everything. And of course, if you read the rest of the meditations, you realize by the end of meditation three that there isn't any such thing, right? That God is is not a deceiver, but um, the devil is a, a deceiver in, in these uh, stories. And in Descartes' case, it's just trying to trick him. It's not trying to make him happy. It's trying to make him not question the existence that he's in, right? In this case, it's really about one's heart desires, one's happiness, what it is that you value most greatly. Uh, Ustia says, Horror Babble does great readings of horror stories and have a few by Bloch. I'll, I'll take your word for that. I spend very little time watching other people's videos or listening to other people's podcasts because time is short and uh, there's so much content out there that I, you know, spend more time like, you know, rereading stuff like this. Um, Perpetual Vinyl Memories, Kurt Vonnegut says somebody gets in trouble, then gets out of it again. People love that story. They never get tired of it. Yeah, although that's super generic. And uh, I think it, what we want to attend to less is like the super, super high level generic stuff and the, more the, the specificity, specificity of what's being put out there. And I, I think that's part of what makes this a great story. We have the, you know, age-old question, what is human happiness? How do we get it? We have the deal with the devil motif, and then we have the changing conditions of um, the interactions uh, of the supernatural, which is quite interesting. Rob Street, would you recommend Byron's Cain, a mystery for a meeting to change perceptions? I don't even know it, so I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I'm not, as you're going to find out, super particularly well-read as a person. So I'm usually um, not not giving an awful lot of recommendations about stuff. Any other questions, comments that people have uh, that they want to bring up? Particularly about this story and its its great themes. All right. Uh, perpetual vinyl memories. What does the train symbolize? Hell, I presume. No, it doesn't symbolize hell at all because that's the depot down yonder that the train is going to. The train is just a way to get down to hell. And it's, uh, it's a nice train to ride up, apparently, if you're a sinner, which apparently everybody on there is, right? You got some some nice stuff. It doesn't symbolize life because it's after your life. It doesn't symbolize suffering because you're not suffering on the train. I would not try to make the train symbolize anything. I would instead take the train as what it is in the narrative. Uh, JB says, the comic I remember was the scientist who sold her soul in, in order to be able to cure a terrible plague. She used her super science to, <laughs> to clone herself so perfectly the devil could not choose between them. Rather subversive around the question of what the soul is. Now, that is a funny one because that assumes that the devil is going to play fair, right? So that if, you, if the devil can't figure out which is the real person that he made the deal with, that um, he will, um, you know, not take anybody in. And I could well imagine a devil saying, you know, because they're, they're a devil, they're a bad person, saying, well, I'll just take both of you instead, right? And uh, maybe also that guy over there, because he is evil. 
And um, who would be holding the devil to following the rules of something like British American jurisprudence, where you're innocent until you know proven guilty, which is not the case in most legal systems. So yeah, that, that's that's an interesting one right there. Um, all right, any other questions, comments? Uh, this is a wonderful little story. Um, I'll be doing actually next next month. I'm going to be doing um, the King of Cats, and I forget exactly the name of the author offhand. Another one of the stories that I read in one of those Alfred Hitchcock anthologies as a kid, and I really love the story. I also am thinking about doing something a little bit more extensive sometime this summer. I've been rereading Graham Greene's The Ministry of Fear, which is a wonderful book, as, as are so many of Graham Greene's novels. This one is actually one that he calls an entertainment. And I've been thinking about doing a reading where I would um, spread it out over days and read. There's about you know close to 14 portions of the book. So I could do, you know, um, two each day over the course of a week at a particular set time and just read my way through it. And I think that could be fun. So I'll probably put some polls out there on, um, you know, my social media and maybe YouTube and see what people happen to think about that. And I think that could be quite enjoyable. So um, we'll see about that. But we're certainly going to be doing more and more of these short story readings. Um, JB says you could do a book just on the weird legalisms around the fairy world and their bargains. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be surprised if somebody already hasn't done a study of that. Um, I think if we were to like do some searching, we probably could dig something up. Perpetual Vinyl Memories, do you like Lawrence Durrell? I've never even heard of Lawrence Durrell, so I'm, I'm, I can't like them. Um, JB says, very good reading, by the way. You could totally do audiobooks as another side gig. Yeah, it's kind of fun to do. I've never actually done this before, <laughs> before I started doing these. Um, I'll tell you who is actually doing that stuff and who's got some of their stuff on LibriVox. My oldest child, Kat Sadler, has been contributing um, tracks on LibriVox. If you don't know LibriVox, it's a massive repository that's been around for decades of volunteers reading uh, audiobooks, uh, chapter by chapter, section by section, and uh, there's some really cool stuff there on that site. I spent many a time doing long distance drives, downloading them and putting them onto CDs and listening to them along the way. All right, well, doesn't look like there's any more questions or comments, so I am going to wrap up here. And I'm going to go and uh, see some cats. And then I got to get back to work, unfortunately. Um, Rob says, thanks for the reading. Kane's a must. Thanks for the Lu Lucian Cynic episode. Catch you next time. Sounds good. So I will see all of you. Hope you have a great rest of the day or if you're overseas, evening or whatever it happens to be for you. And uh, you'll see the rest of, you know, these, these uh, bidding, getting put on my channel well in advance, and um, hopefully you can join me for some of the other ones. I'll see you later.